Tim Marlowe is Chief Executive and Director of the Design Museum London, formerly Artistic Director of the Royal Academy of Arts and Director of Exhibitions of YQ. Tim has been involved in the contemporary art world for the past 30 years as curator, writer and broadcaster. He's worked with many of the most important and influential artists of our time to deliver wide ranging and popular programs and brings a commitment to diverse and engaging exhibitions to his new role showcasing the transformational capacity, capability of design. Marlow sits on the board of trustees of the Imperial War Museum, Sadler's Wells, Art on the Underground Advisory Board and Culture Shop Media. He was awarded an OBE in 2019. Tim, how are you? Welcome. How terrific that you've joined me today. Thank you so much. It's great. It's pity it's not in the flesh, but that'll be soon. I'm good, actually, Julia, but it'd be good to see you face to face. Yes, face to face. Well, I'm looking forward to coming to see you in your new empire, which I think has now opened. So you're, you know, you're reigning supreme in that wonderful building uh, with a wonderful history. It is. It's an extraordinary building. We, we actually open fully to the public on the 31st of July, but we're installing, they're doing the final touches for this electronic show, which is a sort of survey of electronic music and design from Crawford oh, to the Chemical Brothers that actually was um, waiting to go just before lockdown. Then we locked down, then we had to mothball, but at least it means we're opening with something that no one's seen. So it's, it's a new show in that wonderful John Pawson converted building, as you say. Yes, where I used to go and see, I used to go on school trips there. And even <laughs> my sense of museumology was absolutely non-existent. I always used to wonder why everything was so dusty that exhibited there. And it was just incredible. But then I, when it was empty and going round it with the, you know, the former director, Dan Suji, I, you know, it had that incredible structure, that incredible roof, which reminded me of a sort of British version of a Neymar building in a way. I, it took me back to Brazil. That's a very nice parallel, actually. I, I will always think now of Holland Park as having a little corner that is forever, <laughs> ever Brasilia or Niteroi. It's called a hyperbolic paraboloid roof. I hope you're impressed with that. It's something I learnt uh, when I was going through the process of, uh, of getting the job. But it, it, it is an amazing structure, although... Yes. It's so uh, intricately done. I have two problems with it, by the way. I, I don't want to dwell on the negatives, but one is um, it's listed, so we can't have yes. anything off it because it, it can't, um, it can't su support something suspended. So we need design ingenuity to use that, that atrium space. That's one of my challenges. The other is we can't get a phone signal very well through it. So that's my, <laughs> other, that's, that's my other challenge. That's not great. No, it isn't. But having no. said that, the, John Pawson's architecture, there isn't a dust, there isn't a dust um, uh, a grain in sight, even in lockdown that building's immaculate and uh, really i unfamiliar. i went once when i was younger uh, uh, not as frequently as you by the sound of it but it, it, they were dusty vitrines oh, weren't they <laughs> beyond and also <laughs> i mean immensely immensely old-fashioned and i think there was you know you had the the cavemen and then you had the 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 red indians i mean it was all terribly colonial and completely and utterly unacceptable but one of the things i remember being very shocked about when i went um, when I looked at the designs first of all and went round it when well, it was during renovation was John's audacity at putting roof lights in, in, the, in the, that incredible canopy. I thought that was very, very daring and of course very successful as it turned out. It is, and it has that amazingly dramatic sense of space. I mean, yeah. the, the stairs going up onto the first landing yes. and also have seats there. So it's like amphitheatre, atrium, exhibition space and a kind of challenge to, to, to the new director as to how you can articulate or activate all of that space. But it feels very generous when, you, when you're in that space. Yes, it does. Well, I hope you're going to do, be doing lots of concerts during your electronic music um, festival Excellent. Well, we, 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 can, we can live in, in hope of supporting the performing uh, arts and music industry. Uh, I have to say, in case people are watching who are residents nearby, uh, we will stick strictly <laughs> to the conditions of our licence. <laughs> By the way, local residents don't believe a word of it. It's going to be mayhem over there. <laughs> I can send you. If you write to me, I'll give you two's private address. Perfect. So we've, we've started really well. And um, how are you liking being your own boss? Um, well, I don't think my board of trustees would say that, that, that I, no, I think they would actually. I, I do, I, I mean, I like working collaboratively, collegially. Uh, I always have done, but I, I like the challenge of trying to run something. Um, I mean, my real 
aim and interest is to try and get closer to the design communities, to the creative people in the design uh, worlds. Uh, not that they weren't close to the museum before, but you know that was the thing I loved at the Royal Academy and indeed working at, at White Cube. It's probably something you find continues from your role at the Serpentine now with Tadeus that you know you work closely with great artists or and creative people. I mean, I work with architects at the Academy too, and I find that really, um, I mean, I find it inspiring. I, I don't, I don't have a kind of romantic notion of what artists are in the flesh. They're like you and me, but there is sometimes a sometimes a substantial, sometimes just a subtle difference in the way that they engage with the world or see the world. And I'm fascinated by that in design as well, where there's a, a practical or functional aspect as well as um, as well as a creative one. Well, I mean, one of the things that I think is really extraordinary is that often, I wouldn't say always, people who come to the museum are looking at objects that they they may have a similar one at home. They may have the exact replica at home. And whilst I'm sure you're taking them into realms of uncharted territory, um, it's a very familiar, it's a, it's a much more familiar sort of object-based um, material in a way that you're working with. And so that, I hope, leads to people being feeling very much more involved in the museum, very much more engaged and also easier to engage them. I think so. I mean, you know, the phones that we're communicating on now, the technology that we're using, as well as the clothes we're wearing or the pens we're writing or the glasses we're wearing. I mean, these are all designed. Yes, and, definitely. and design has this way of, of helping us to improve our relationship with and sometimes complicating or worsening our relationship with the world around us. So it's clearly uh, it, it's, it's clearly potentially something that, that we can really engage with and through in a museum. But it is interesting because it's it's um, the design museum has. I think more diverse in terms of age and ethnicity audiences than, than any other museum of comparable status in London. I've seen the figures, but we're reasonably diverse, but we know we need to be more so. But what's mm. interesting is that the professions of, uh, in design and architecture are, 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 are undiverse, and that's a, that's a challenge to us. But just to go back to your point about engaging with people through objects, absolutely. But um, Design is also structures, systems and spaces. And that, I find that fascinating. So although I can come back home after a day in the museum and think, oh, yeah, my um, kettle is you know, in the collection and it, it works beautifully. Um, and I could occasionally look at the, um, the, you know, the, the, the architecture of the house I live in, although it's nothing like the design museum. Um, how you organise things, people, social systems, political systems, um, I find that quite daunting and quite interesting. And that's the yes, area that I think design has got so much to, to play in um, and that we've all got quite well, a lot to learn from. I mean, Alice Rawson, who I talked to earlier in the series of these teas, was talking about how she particularly chose design because of its broadness of scope. So that there's no aspect of life that does, design doesn't permeate and affect and I think that's incredibly exciting because with, with the visual arts, for example, even if you diversify into architecture, which of course we did at the Nine, and indeed design, that it, you know, if we'd suddenly had politics um, close to us, there would have been, I think, a few raised eyebrows, which actually, whereas for you, you can do that and it's, it's broadly part of the remit or you can make it as part of the remit as you, as you would like. No, you're absolutely right. And that's the opportunity. But of course, the the more daunting aspect or the aspect that one's really going to get one head around is um, are, how many different kinds of audiences in the plural uh, are there for design and how much is there a common overlap? Because, you know, even at my time at the Royal Academy, um, of course, you get specific kinds of audiences or a different kind of demographic for an Ai Weiwei show, as say, against an Oceania show, as say, against a Renaissance nude exhibition. But there's still a core of people, and it's broadly made up of those rather wonderful and enlightened, supportive friends who are you know, mm. 90,000 of them at the Royal Academy, um, who are prepared and interested, and they'll trust the institution, yes. and they'll come and see most things. They don't, they don't necessarily like everything, and there's mm -hmm. some things they don't come back to, but that there's a curiosity and there's something about art with a capital A that links it all. Whereas I don't know if that's, I'm sure that isn't the case with design, but I, I, I do know that, you know, graphic design, architecture, technology, um, industrial design, of course, there must be things that uh, draw many people um, uh, to see all of those things, but I know it's tribal too. And I have to work that out. I mean, that's, I find that fascinating too. Well, I think what I learned from being at the Serpentine was that it's about a, creating a community. And of course, there, and as we all know, there are many, many communities. And so how fascinating that you, you can create wonderful collisions, wonderful connections that perhaps didn't exist 
I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And what about technology? Do you, call, do you include technology as part of design work that's pioneering work is being done every other second practically? Absolutely. I mean, I think design has many overlaps. One is with art, the, the creative aspect of it. The other is with technology and science. But it still needs design to put it into functional practice or to explore how it can, it can operate. And I think technology is critical. I mean, funnily enough, I, I did a, an interview uh, in November at the Saraband Foundation um, with a robot. Uh, she's called Ida. Uh, oh. She identifies as female and as an artist and produces work. Um, and, um, any good, I, by the way? Any good or any possibility shows coming up at the Design Museum, maybe? Well, watch this space. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You, you've nailed it. I mean, it's the art any good. It's fascinating. And she is, yeah. uh, or it is, extraordinary. Uh, but I suddenly thought, you know, this was a kind of Ballardian glimpse into the future, the near future. Yes. Um, yes. But at the same time, the, the ingenuity and the, the algorithmical programming that goes into uh, that area but also the ethical aspect you know the darker aspect of of what technology can do and, wh and wh where we where we fear it as well as harness it and um, all of that seems to be central territory for the design museum so yeah watch this space well that's exciting i hope i mean it's very much part of the news the you know the hacking and how that works and how you know it's way beyond my abilities way 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 beyond my abilities but actually people can be very you know, you can, in a way, have, there, are, there, there is no need not to have access to anything now if you have the skills, the technological skills, anything. And that's kind of fascinating. And the ability to subvert and to dysregulate and, and really profoundly alter aspects of our lives that were pre previously unthinkable. So that's another, I hope you're going to explore that fully. <laughs> yeah, no, I have. And, and, and obviously what we're going through now will change work patterns and people's relationships to technology. And more mm. people have engaged with it. I mean, you know, the idea that the uh, older generations are now much more technologically literate than they were at the beginning of lockdown seems borne out by the you know, experience that families have weekly of Zoom calls with grandparents yeah. and so on. But I do also think it reinforces, I mean, I said at the beginning how nice it was to see you, but you know, I really want to see you face to face. I want to share mm. the the same space as you. I want to come and see the exhibitions you're putting on and I want to show you the things that we're doing in that communal, visceral, physical space. And I think so it's a very interesting thing around technology that it facilitates and gives us many more opportunities to engage and to explore ideas yeah. and to showcase what we're doing. But it doesn't, it doesn't replace the need no. to be communally there, which of course the performing arts are really facing um, uh, and they're up against it at the moment. But I hope there's light at the end of the tunnel for them as there is for museums. Yes, because I, one of my questions is, you know, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing museums now, but also, let's say, in 10 years' time? Obviously, there's the, the, we're still in a kind of lockdown. We've got the after effects of COVID-19, and then we've got the future of museums. And the difficulty of, for audiences to really relate to something which seems apart instead of inclusive, and that's where I think the design museum has incredible advantages over other institutions. No, it's true. Although people want to come to museums for, uh, for another experience, to experience the other rather than the, to reinforce that with, with which they're familiar. But I think that that, that design can do both. Um, I, I think the challenges for museums in the next uh, few years and up to 10 years, I mean, the critical one will be economic. Uh, mm. You know, we know the, the financial model for museums. I mean, I think British museums in general have done incredibly well. I mean, the, the, of course, the state funding and they, they've been in, 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 it's an important support mechanism. But the yeah. private fi, private funding that museums have raised has been impressive. And I think that the, the, the stretch and the stress on that going forward is going to be huge. And, and I think some institutions will go under. Um, I think scale is an interesting thing. I think we've all in the museum world looked to get bigger and bigger and increase scale. And I think there's scope, of course, for the Uber museums. I mean, I, 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 I love in my working lifetime, the, the, you know, the expansion, the rise and rise of Tate. I think London now is a world class museum of modern contemporary as well as British art in yeah. one institution. And it's national and, and international. But um, but I sometimes crave the scale of the serpentine where there's just beautiful i mean it's, it's you can do substantial shows but on a scale that is just different to other other places and i think that i think the museums have to look at range of scale i think museums have to stop trying to be uh, as many things as possible to as many people as possible and i think that, that there has to be a slightly re realignment i mean the blockbuster show it's all very well us 
saying and i've heard other colleagues say yeah blockbusters we've got to stop doing them so many and we've got to stop the travel and the expense and that's true but but of course it's the financial model on which so many museums are built and we have to look at that and reconfigure that but i think there's a serious reappraisal of of what museums the the, the scope of uh, and the expense of what they do i mean london is so rich in terms of its museums mm. but but how many of those museums have really focused in the last 10 years on their collections. And I think that's obviously something that museums will have to, to, to consider and reconsider much more. I think the, the really interesting thing about the blockbuster is that people, the way, the reason it's been so successful and the reason it's the go-to uh, solution to, you know, increasing funding, increasing audiences is because it's a true and tried method. It's a model that works. Yeah. Um, but actually there's no reason why there shouldn't be as much connection with something which is not, does not cost a fortune. It requires more ingenuity and it requires more inventiveness and it requires more um, lateral thinking. But th that's really the new, for me at least, that's a new model. And also how to engage people of all, all audiences, all, all um, periods, because you have the, um, you have the, um, you know, the education bits. If you go into Tate at the weekend, you have the play area for children. But the museum is not predicated for people of all ages, really, in my view, at least, in a, in a holistic way. So I, I spent some time thinking about a year ago about how to create a series, a whole annual, a whole, whole year of play within a museum that really did engage everybody at, at all levels. But I think I digress, and I think we need to focus on that, because there are two things I really want to talk to you about, is... Um, one, what it was like being director of exhibitions at the Royal Academy when all your bosses, how many artists are there that run the Royal Academy? About 126 at the last count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my lordy lordy. 126 artists were your individual and collective boss. Um, you know, artists we know are a wild card. That's why you love them. And that's why we love working with them and why we, lear I, we all learn so much from them. But... Um, how far did you have to go to, to really argue your corner in terms of the projects you believed in? Um, to the ends of the earth. But actually, it's really interesting. I mean, literally, I went to Oceania. Um, but it's very interesting that they, it is artist-led, but, of course, mm. artists collectively wield power, but not individually. And so there's a rotation on council, which is the governing body. So artists sit there for three years or in two year cycles. Uh, the committees likewise are rotated. The president is elected and re-elected each year. Um, and if, if, in fact, if, if there's two things. One is that being appointed to be, it was, uh, you're right, the director of exhibitions, then they, they increase the post, maybe artistic director. The, the, there wasn't much point them appointing someone like me if they weren't interested in what I thought and what I wanted to do. And they knew that I was reasonably opinionated and um, uh, confident in some aspects of my opinions and, and happy and prepared to listen to in others. And I remember somebody saying who'd been there before, you have to be careful with the artists. They think they know more than you do. And I said, well, they, they do in many cases. So yeah. if you have a relationship with, with, with artists who you respect... And there were so many of them there who I did mm. respect. Actually, they become sounding boards. They help generate ideas. They become yeah. the way to which ideas get filtered. And so it becomes kind of quite collaborative or collegial. But there are political and institutional mechanisms th that you can play with to get things through. You're not beholden to every artist deciding they've got to agree exactly <laughs> what it is you want to do. I mean, the, the Royal Academy... What's amazing is everyone said, oh, it's kind of, it's, it's chaotic the way it's been um, put together over the, over the years. And I, and I do agree that um, were the Academy not to exist and it was to be invented tomorrow, you wouldn't do it in the way you wouldn't be able to invent it as it is now. But actually, it's much more functional than, um, than I thought it was going to be. And, um, and I love that aspect about it. It's, it's eccentricity. It has a kind of yes. can-do attitude. I mean, artists, if the idea is good enough, I mean, they're pretty ambitious. Um, mm. uh, so sell a good idea and get backing for it and, um, and off you go. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there are, of course, the, the tension of, is that a lot of the artists who are there harbour the desire, understandably, to have shows there. But at the yes. same time, um, for that reason, um, you have a certain um, 
you have certain leverage because you have, as artistic director, what they want, which is the power hmm. to program. And you've got to take everyone <laughs> with it. So, yeah, there's a, there, there, you, you know, you can see where I'm coming from. But, um, yeah. but it wasn't, you can't be an authoritarian artistic director or exhibitions director there. It has to be collaborative. But I would say that has to be the case in most institutions. It's just yeah. you're dealing with a different power base or a different skill yeah. set. Yes. I mean, the Royal Academy, because the, you know, the fact you don't have any public uh, or you, I'm speaking as though you're still there, but in a way, for the purpose We don't have any song. public funding. The design museum yes. doesn't have much public funding either. So exactly. I, 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 so I'm, I'm linked in that way. Yes, and also the Serpentine didn't. So when I started, I thought, well, you know, there's a great institution doing extraordinary shows. They don't have a, a, a public funding. So that when I thought about the decision about which way to go, sort of really plough the fire of the pund public funding route or do things which are more independent... Um, I took the latter option because it seemed a more exciting one to me, uh, albeit uh, in some ways a more risky, risky one. Didn't you, Did go, you... For, didn't you go for a mixed economy? Did, the, this, isn't being, I'm not, this is generally not being accusatory, but the Serpentine gets 10 times the Arts Council's funding of the Design Museum right now. So that's reasonably substantial. Well argued, Tim, if I may say so. Well <laughs> argued. <And> that, <laughs> of course, but when, we st when I started... It was nothing. Um, it, I mean, nothing. Absolutely right, I need, nothing. I need a private conversation with you for leverage. I have to say, by the way, uh, as this is a, a, an interview of public record as well as a, a, um, a, an intimate conversation, that the Arts Council have been incredibly supportive of the Design Museum over this yeah. uh, traumatic period. So I salute them. But I just was curious about funding models and how you, what you inherited and, what, and, and the way you saw it developing. And you're still not, yes. you still weren't fully dependent on public subsidy, were you, were you obviously? It was more private no, funding no, than public. No, no, yeah. no, 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 yeah. no. I mean, I'm, I'm not so in touch with the, with the proportion, the percentage now. Well, ours and, is just um, under 2% of our total needs. At the, uh, so yeah. there's a lot to, there's a lot to do. Well, that, but that's a, that's a great, great sort of position to argue and to, to make your case and exciting. It just, it, they're a different group of artists in inverted commas to the ones you had at the Royal Academy, but the principles are the same. Absolutely. So at the bottom of your screen, you will see, talking about the Royal Academy, um, I'm, oh, very, yes. I'm very fascinated by the exhibitions you presented there, and we're going to come on to one in particular, which I'd love to, to, to talk to you about in detail, but which were your favourite shows there? Which, which was the ones that, of the three during your tenure, which were the ones, three shows you were most proud of? You see, I only have one child, but that's like asking which is your favourite child, so I can always give that answer. Um, yes, uh, I, I can I mean, tell you how I resolved that after you've given you could me do the that. answer. Uh, yeah. uh, let me give you the, the genuine answer, which is I love the entirety because I love the opportunity. I mean, I, you know, I have I have very broad interests, eclectic tastes. Um, you could say attention deficit disorder uh, culturally. So I love doing different things. So I love the range of, of that, which we did. I really did. I have to say Ai Weiwei was a game changer because it, mm -hmm. was, it was programmed. I had to cancel something that really wasn't working. We had a, a year to make that exhibition. And I think that really did change the way um, the Academy saw the potential of contemporary art to bring audiences, but also the way that the Academy worked, which was that it was, everyone was prepared and happy and, you know, uh, um, relished the idea of trying to do something very ambitious in, in a year with someone who was yeah. locked, locked down in, in Beijing for most of that time. Uh, I think abstract expressionism was a phenomenal exhibition uh, that, yeah. you know, it, it, it took a familiar subject, a pivotal moment in the 20th century, the kind of show that, most of the other institutions, I remember having conversations with, with colleagues from other institutions saying that it felt like too big a subject to take on board, given that, in yeah. fact, most of those artists had been dealt with monographically and in brilliant shows yeah. over the previous 20 years. But I love the ambition of that. And it felt like the place to do it was, you know, a, a community of artists. Um, and then there's a, I mean, where do I, where do I possibly put, you know, put, I mean, this, pulling off Oceania with all the cultural negotiations and diplomacy that was necessary was pretty uh, amazing. But, you know, Anthony Gormley's exhibition at the end that filled the main galleries with 70 tonnes of, uh, of, of water and mud um, that had sort of 45 tonnes of, of structure made uh, and welded in situ that I think there was we counted not individually but i think we estimated about three hundred and fifty thousand spot welds in the piece in in, in the in main gut i mean that was a hell of a, a hell of a um, um, an achievement and a collaborative achievement with an artist studio engineers and that curatorial team at the academy that 
who have got great expertise um, in mm. many things, but who are prepared to work across the board in any subject that's thrown at them. And I love that about them, that they're not territorial mm. curators. They're people who will work with anyone and in almost any context that, that, that they're asked to, which is terrific. Well, in, in fact, thank you for segueing so neatly into, into uh, an exhibition you haven't mentioned, the work of Anselm Kiefer, which I loved. I mean, firstly, I adore Anthony. I was hugely admiring of that show. It, took, it really took my breath away for an, many, many reasons, including the fact that on the face of it, it was nothing in a way was what it seemed. Um, to have that, ex and I'm not going to, I don't, unfortunately don't remember the name of the title of the work, but that incredible wire, um, wire line that went across galleries, um, stretched from one wall to another to Co how to hold that tension. Coordinative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, how, to, how to hold that tension without pulling the whole building down. Things that the general public, there were so many examples of, of, of works that had the most complicated um, sort of extraordinary solutions in order to just put them on the wall where on the face of it you if you were if you didn't know this and you walked around you just go oh yeah right I mean I like it I don't like it I'm interested by it I'm not interested by it and all the nuances in between but you could never understand how what an extraordinary feat that show was but Anthony like Anselm Kiefer both of them are incredibly comfortable with scale and I find this very, very fascinating. And I know that you worked with Anselm very, very closely. And on the screen is um, an example of three paintings from the Royal Academy show. Mm. Um, but there was also an, a really wonderful piece in the, in the courtyard, as well as this very, very handsome sculpture. And um, Anselm really embraces scale in the most extraordinary way. It's just work after work, exhibition after exhibition, quite like breathing almost. What was your experience? How was it to work with him? Well, what I, did you think of the show? I thought the show was great. I mean, I, and I didn't mention it, um, partly because um, it was... It, it was it was an inherited show, and in a sense, I, I worked on the other side with with Anselm. I was you know often in the studio, and the curator was Kathleen Soriano of that exhibition. Yes. So pay tribute to Kathleen. So I'd worked with Kathleen um, before when I was not at the academy, and then inherited that show, and she she stayed on as curator to to do the show, mm -hmm. and it felt very. Um, I mean, it was it was it was it contextualised Anselm. It surveyed the early work and put them into a certain uh, put his work into a certain context, and then. Uh, it worked very well. She worked brilliantly with, and the Academy has this capacity to work really well with artists collaboratively. So Anselm took on the spaces. That's your point about scales. Yes. Well, so, so yes. well made. So I thought that was a very confident curatorial strategy, and the in, the institution was very confident in handing over or, or cajoling artists to work with them on and, and to take on the spaces, which is what Anthony did as well as Anselm. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I've 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 known Anselm now for. for about 18 years and uh, I, I feel close to him I, I admire him hugely and I think that level of ambition engagement the kind of intellectual curiosity and facility he has he's one of the best read people I've ever encountered yes. um, I always speak to him in about his third or fourth language which is English um, yes. but he you know he, he's, he's multilingual and his art is is multilingual too and his facility with different materials and that kind of mischievous sense of well why can't we do that well let's try and do that <laughs> I think is yeah. it's amazing but I what well, I tell you the thing when you, you, you asked me a question about the Academy, um, I've hmm. always had this jokey uh, teasing of him where I ask him about whether he's a history painter, uh, which is Joshua Reynolds, you know, the first president. Reynolds had a hierarchy of art and history was the highest form of art. And hmm. Anselm always says, no, no, not, no, I'm not an academic artist. Well, he's not, but he's definitely yeah. a history painter. History hmm. is his central subject. The piece that you can see yes. is the piling up of his own history of canvases. There's that sense of, a, of, a, of an ancient civilization that's just been either collapsed or has been rediscovered and the layering of history and the layering of myth and the concerns of history as a central subject as well as individual narratives or histories uh, uh, play central to that work and that looked really brilliant at, at the Royal Academy because he connected so fantastically with the Academy's past but also it felt like a reconfiguration of what history painting was in, in a way that Reynolds would have understood it so it played out brilliantly I thought.
And also there's a tremendous, um, well, I'm going to remind you of something which um, was just before I started the Serpentine, and we went with, with Robert McPherson to see his exhibition at the Neue National Gallery in Berlin. I don't know if you remember I that. do, yes, I do. And, and afterwards, for some reason, I, I lost in the midst of time, we went to the fun fair, <laughs> one of those fair... <laughs> Carousels, so, yeah. Fl so, flipping terrifying. I thought the best thing I can do is just kind of be reasonably dignified, although I'm sure I screamed <laughs> throughout. Um, and I remember very well looking at my watch uh, and thought, if I just can concentrate on the face of my watch, I'm going to survive <laughs> this experience. But in a way, it was kind of curiously appropriate to go to see that Kiefer exhibition, which was phenomenal by any stand standards. And it left a different kind of impression on me than the Royal Academy one did, because although I'd seen Kiefer's work before in London, I hadn't, the, 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 in the Berlin exhibition, there was really a sense of the epic and the grandeur of it. And, you know, it was, it, it was really, in a way, what religion it very often is successful in doing and certainly endeavours to do, which is make you consider how small you are in the greater scheme of things. And that exhibition in Berlin really did that. And then the Royal Academy, what the Royal Academy showed it for me was to really make me understand better what Kiefer's extraordinary contribution, because as well as the works of scale, there were also very tender, gentle um, quiet works with drawings and, and, and watercolours. So it was a combination of the two that was so uh, exceptional, really. And I didn't, I wasn't convinced that the show would, at, at the Royal Academy, Kiva show at the Royal Academy, was going to be as extraordinarily impressive and convincing as it was. I've used the word convincing twice, but I was really, really bowled over by it. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, that intimacy. I mean, those, those watercolours. Mm -hmm. He makes the most beautiful books still. I mean, lead, yes, lead pages. But also yes. there, were, there were books using of contemporary watercolours yes. towards the end of that show. And there is this amazing facility with, uh, we talk about scale, but touch. The touch for Keeper is sometimes, and everyone thinks it's like this, you know, it's expansive and, and, yes. and, and theatrical. And there's an element of spectacle, of course. But there's a real intimacy and sensuality of touch as well. Yes. In, in, and he has that intellectual capacity to, to, to shift those kind of scales. I mean, poetry is the thing that, that it, I mean, when you, we talk about works of art as being poetic, it's often a cop out. We don't, it's yes. just, it can be very vague and nebulous. But Kiefer yes. is fascinated by poetry and its affect. And, yes. um, and, uh, and so he has the interest in and sometimes the sensibility of a poet in the way he uses materials. But of course, you know, he says he lives in language and words and the incorporation of words into paintings, like he incorporates objects into paintings, do um, amazing things. And so I came, you know, I knew about Paul Salan, but I've read Salan mm -hmm. much more uh, intensively because of Kiefer, Ingeborg Bachmann. Um, and then your exhibition in... in um, in uh, Salzburg at the moment, Walter von der Vogelweide. Kiefer mentioned this German lyric, medieval German lyric yes. to me a decade or so ago. I have to say, it's it's probably not for me. I prefer Salam, but I love the fact that and he says pre Goethe, this was the great German yes. poet, the poet of German identity. Yes. And when you know that, you understand Kiefer's interest in him, but also the lyrical love aspect of of the work. So it works on on, on a number of scales and, and uh, interesting, and it relates to. The first paintings you showed at the Royal Academy, which was The Last Room, yes. which was a series he made. The, the series is called The Morgenthau Plan. So it was the post-war German economic recovery. Um, he uses similar motifs, the wheat fields, that also relate mm. to his love of Van Gogh. But the wheat fields uh, also relate to the, uh, uh, the Walter von uh, de Vogelweide paintings too. And I love the fact that similar motifs are layered with different associations, different <coughs> meanings with Kiefer. And that the starting point can go in all sorts of different directions and there's this overlap and and collectors as well as historians um, art historians um would sometimes just frustration is the wrong word but would say well um when does this it, when did this series start and when did it finish and you can say well in some ways this the, the, you know the, he's been working with uh Walter von der Vogelweide for a long time but this is a new series and it may finish next year but it may be picked up again in 15 years time yes. and that elision uh, 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 the, the, the things that are eliding in Kiefer is really fascinating actually and, and there's always ongoing themes and, and, and interests um 
that, that he has. And so, and also, uh, the, the, the paintings in Salzburg, I know, stem back to him moving to the south of France. I mean, that's where the, the, the fields mm. really started to appear. And that description you gave earlier of, of religious overwhelming, so the sublime, I think we'd call it. Yeah. Um, Barjac, I don't know if you ever uh, went, I'd imagine you did, but this place well, in the south of yes. France, which was an old silk factory, but he converted the whole of the landscape with these towers, the cast from the co concrete, concrete casts of shipping containers. He made an amphitheatre. He made an underground labyrinth. Mm. There are 40 breeze block pavilions. There are studios. Can you, can you see the image on yeah, screen? That, because, because, so because, that's the, yes. the amphitheatre. Unbelievable. Yes. Cast from, Unbelievable. Cast from uh, shipping containers. But then you go in through, yes. those, uh, in through those entrances. There are spaces where there's other works. There are ladders. These are the towers. He did two of them in the Royal Academy courtyard. I mean, yes. this is a Gesamtkunstwerk, which, is, it's, which he completed and then left and moved studios to Paris. But He's now inviting other artists. Laurie Anderson yes. um, uh, was, was, was there Valley recently. Valley Export was one. Valley Export, you know, indeed, re Austria. recently. Yeah. Yes, and, when um, other gallery today is back artists. Indeed. indeed. Where <laughs> he, wants the, he wants the artist to intervene or to make yes. things or to perform and use that space. So it's having yes. its next, in the next chapter. But if you look at that scale and ambition where he treats the landscape in the same way that he treats a canvas in a similar way to that which he treats a small piece of paper, you see the consistency in, 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 it's in him. extraordinary. Yeah. But it's that, it's that ability to be completely undaunted, fearless, really fearless. Yeah. I mean, there's a fantastic quote, if I may, I'd like to read, um, because one of my most favourite exhibitions of all time, I, mean, I would put it actually in my top three, was the Royal Academy's uh, Van Gogh exhibition, the real Van Gogh, the Unless artist it's... on his letter. Oh, yeah. my God. One of the, I think, I mean, not even on the fingers of one hand, when I've walked around the exhibition and been reduced to tears by the sheer, really the connection to, to an artist and what Van Gogh was trying to do. And as you say, of course, Van Gogh was so incredibly important for Kiefer. Mm -hmm. So the, the quote, which is in the catalogue that we've, um, the, the, the Ropak Gallery has produced, says the painters were, the, paint, the pictures were painted in Bajarac in the south of France. The grass, the entire vegetation was so dried out that the light yellow stalks and the withered sithesles made for a whole variety of ochre and yellow shades which delighted me, which in their beauty on the verge of decay reminded me of the grim reaper, Eros and Thanatos, as I walked through the glowing fields. I kept on thinking of Walter van der Vergelweide, his love songs, his poems, so closely bound up with his life. And I mean, you know, this is, he, Kiefer is a great poet, a great writer, uh, a great thinker, and of course, a great artist. So I, I, um, I really, how fascinating and how lucky you were to work with him. I would only answer could see Eros and Thanatos, sex and death in a field of, uh, a field of dried out uh, <laughs> straw. Well, you know, that, I mean, you know, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. And um, very, very, very exciting. Well, I, this, we're coming to the end of our time together, which is very sad for me. I greatly look forward to seeing you in person. Um, and I wish you extraordinarily well at the Design Museum. I look forward to see, seeing the electronic music show. Uh, I want to be as, all my senses to be um, assaged as I walk through the doors. And I hope the neighbours will really be quaking in their boots. <laughs> come, down, come down and dance. Yes, I will. I look forward to it hugely. Tim, thank you so very, very much. It's a pleasure, I'm Julia. now just going to end on a, on a note about um, what we've got on our galleries. And so have a good summer. And I uh, hope to see you before too long. And you. Many thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Um, you can now rewatch previous teas with Julia on our IGT, IGTV or on our YouTube channel. Anselm Kiefer's exhibition in our Salzburg Gallery opens today. In our gallery in the Marais, Paris, we have an exhibition of new work by Jules de Banancourt called There Are More Eyes Than Leaves on the Trees. Also on display is Mark Brandenburg's Snowflake. Today is the last day to view Dimensions of Reality, Female Minimal, at our Paris Gallery in Pantin. And it's the most extraordinary, both shows are extraordinary shows. Meanwhile, our London Gallery is showing a summer group exhibition until the end of the month. This will be the last tea with me before the London Gallery closes in August. Thank you very much indeed for tuning in every Saturday and I shall look forward to seeing you in September when the Gallery reopens. Happy summer and goodbye. <laughs>